Hi there. Welcome to world building. Um, basically, I'm just going to be talking about what goes into making your own original world, whether it be for a tabletop campaign or if you happen to be interested in writing and getting into a career in writing, how you can better enrich the world that you're trying to bring forth to the masses. Um, there's a great deal that goes into building a world of your own creation and it can literally be either as rich or as barren as you decide to make it. You know, it's kind of a no-brainer. Um, first of all, there's the general lore, like the history, the history of your world and timelines. And chances are the timeline will become the bane of your existence as it has become with me. Um, let me bring it up. Basically, just a list of all the dates and all the occurrences that have, occur that have happened. Ah, sorry. Technical malfunction. And just trying to keep all the dates straight. It, it's really handy to have a physical manifestation of it. But more importantly, what happened to make your world the way it is? Like, is it a war-torn world? Is it post-apocalyptic? Are people living in domes under the sea? Are certain races enslaved while others roam free? You know, those kinds of things. And the timeline is a really good place to pinpoint when those things happened and why, who did it. Um, also, does anybody in your world try to change all these things? Who and when? These can also go in the timeline. Family trees is another part of the lore, and that's actually a lot of fun. <laughs> um, you can go old school and do it all in paper. I personally prefer to use this site called Family Echo, and it allows you to input photos of any face claims you might have for your characters. And it's a very detailed family tree. It's very, it's a very handy thing to have in your arsenal. Um, it also lets you add spouses and children if any of your characters are married or parents. However, it does not allow for you to use numeral dates that are outside of the norm. So say, say you're working on a sci-fi epic. You wouldn't be able to input any of star dates that you would find in like Star Trek or Star Wars it because those times haven't happened yet they don't exist according to the site so you have to kind of you have to improvise but it's a really small price to pay for the convenience of keeping all the names and the lineages straight because the bigger your world gets the more people you add to it and it's just really easy to forget who is married to who, who is the offspring of whom, and just, it's better for your sanity to have something. Um, another part of general lore would be just astronomy. How many suns, how many moons, what are the constellations of this world of yours? Then there's geography. No. How is the land divided? Are there multiple kingdoms? Are they, and if there are multiple kingdoms, are they their own sovereign nation or do they fall under the rule of a single kingdom in the end? Is one solitary kingdom instead the one that rules all the various regions? Um, it also helps to have a map because trust me, you will forget where things are. It sometimes helps to have a giant picture on your wall. So when you're writing a scene and you're thinking to myself, okay, they need to get here. How long is that gonna take? That should take no more than a couple hours. And then you look at the map and you're just like, crap, no. It's gonna take a couple days or a week, fine. Um, but getting back to the geography, um, does each region have various climate changes? Do they experience all four seasons or are they limited to just one? Like 
the very top kingdom on the map is just, it's essentially the land of ice and snow. You know, nothing but snow, nothing but ice, just eternal winter. But all the other kingdoms experience everything else. Um, do the various regions have any noticeable landmarks? Um, multiple mountain ranges, abundance of water in any given area, lots of forests, and again, maps really come in handy for that. Um, just as an FYI, the map that you draw for your own personal reference doesn't have to be a masterpiece. I mean, if you are gifted in the art of cartography, kudos to you. <laughs> um, another thing, what are, the what are the battle standards? Like, do the kingdoms or the cities or the whatever part of your world that you're making, do they have a crest? Do they have an emblem? These are all little things. Um, do the specific regions, are they famous for any particular trade commodity? Horses, crops, boats, fish, fabrics. Basically, what makes that particular region special? What makes them stand out? What makes people want to go to there? And lastly, but not least, races. What are they? What are their strengths and weaknesses? What are their lifespans? Are any of the races immortal or are they just long lived? Can they be killed? What are their cultural practices? And this actually gets to be a lot of fun. And because you get to basically create holidays and decide how they're celebrated amongst everybody. Do they have any specific burial rites or marriage ceremonies? What kind of society are they? Mat matriarchal or patriarchal? Are they a monarchy? Are they an oligarchy? There's a lot of things that you need to decide to make your world yours. Um, what are their religious beliefs? What are their pantheons? Are they monotheistic? Are they polytheistic or ditheistic, in which they have two deities? Um, do they have one deity responsible for everything? And if they are polytheistic, which deity is in charge of what? Yeah. Um, any questions so far? <laughs> yeah. Um, so you said like the land of ice and snow. Now there's nowhere that people live here where it's always <laughs> like ice and snow. So things like that where it's different from our world, do you find harder to get into that mindset to write about? Or, be, or if you have an overabundance of those things, do you think it would be hard to write about? Or should you keep certain things like same to our world so that you don't, I don't know. It's really up to you. Um, for me anyway, because it worked with the world that I was making. Uh, the, it, it served the story better for that one land to just be cold all the time and I don't know how cold the winters get in North Dakota but in Minnesota where I'm from it kind of is a land of ice and snow for a few months so it was actually really easy to write that part simply because I was living it at the time that I was writing that particular segment of the book so it was just like Okay, this works. And while it's always good to keep just like even a toe based in reality to make some aspects of the story believable, it's your sandbox. You get to do what you want with it. If you want one land to just be summer all the time, that's fine. You know, it all depends on what works best for your story and your characters. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, anything else? Not. Yeah. I find that it's really easy to use. You just set up an account and then you just, you start with, I guess, your main, your main character, your protagonist, and then you just go from there. You branch out with spouses and children and grandparents, great grandparents, and basically as far back as you want to go. And it helps you to keep track. And you can include photos and and uh, 
yeah, like I said, they're a little temperamental when it comes to dates, like if you're using a date that isn't recognized, but it's a small price to pay for your sanity, I think. Um, so do you take like climate into like weather patterns into, the, um, into check when you try to like create your worlds? Like, so like you have the hot area over here and then the cold area over here. I mean, even for like where, where we're at in the US, mm -hmm. there's going to be tornado, like tornado alleys and stuff like that. Maybe yeah. You certainly can. I mean, in the kingdom of Sephiris, which is in the western part of the map, they're a very oceanic kingdom, so they would get tsunamis and water disasters and that sort of thing. In addition to being the main trade hub of the kingdom, they would get a lot of the aquatic issues that, unlike Ares, the northerly kingdom, and I actually did write it into the third book. They do deal with blizzards on a fairly regular basis and snowstorms. And when that sort of thing happens, you just really got to duck and cover, <laughs> head for your nearest cave or shelter and just wait it out. And if there's no shelter to be found, you're SOL because you will not survive the storm. Um, And Garnetia, the southernmost kingdom, they're the ones that have a volcano, so they have to deal with eruptions when the fire dragon gets mad. <laughs> but so long as they keep him happy with gifts and presents, then he doesn't make any lava go spew. <laughs> Dragons are hoarders, they like presents and shinies. Um, any other questions? I guess that kind of leads into my, the, my question of how much research do you do about things like weather and those kind of phenomena? Literally as much research as you feel is necessary. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it is your world. You get to decide how frequent these weather phenomena occur if they're, if it's mainly, if it's done during a certain point of the year, if it's a regular occurrence, like in the case of the Northern Kingdom, where not many people live there because of its harshness, but it's still a necessity to keep that land settled. So they're a hardy bunch. <laughs> and also a little quirky because there aren't that many people there. But, um. You can be as realistic as you want when it comes to phenomenon and the frequency with which they occur. They can be once in a while, or they can have a way of detect, if it's a fantasy setting, maybe they can have some sort of spell to help detect tornadoes or whatever you would call them. And if it was a fantasy setting, I'm sure they'd have a different name for them. Um, they might have a magical spell or charm, and they'd be like, or when the moons align, that's when, <laughs> you know, it's whatever you want to do. Don't let anybody tell you what to do. It's your world, your sandbox. You build as many sandcastles as you want. <laughs> uh, being, as you're um, writing uh -huh. and building a world, um, do you start with one area and then start generating the map organically, or do you try to, how much of a world do you build to begin with? Do you try to map everything out, or do you actually, you know? A little of column A and a little of column B. Um, when I first started my series, I knew that there was gonna be a high throne, and I knew that I wanted the other kingdoms to, while they're still their own sovereign nation, they control, they pass their own laws and control how they rule their own people. They still answer to the high throne in certain aspects. And when 
the high throne demands that they pick up the banner and answer the call to arms, they'll, they'll answer the call. So I tried to, as I was building the map, I tried to make each kingdom its own individual thing and have their own individual strengths that tied into the dragon which dwelled in their particular lands. Like say the kingdom of Terranus is where the earth dragon lives. So they have the most fertile land. They are where all the crops for all of Primordia are grown. Sephiris is where the water dragon dwells. They're the trade hub. All the trade from other lands comes through them and gets divvied out. Garnetia is where the fire dragon lives. Um, they do a lot of pottery and they basically tie into, and the people of each region also, they kind of take a little bit of their influence from their land, like people of Ter the people of Ter Terranus, they're very, they're just very happy, they're, they have a lot of children, because <laughs> fertility, fertile land and all that. Um, people of Sephiris, they're, it's where a lot of the merchants are, and bless you, is in height, welcome. So I tried to make the land influence the people as well. And in the middle of all of it is Meluria, and they basically get the final say on anything that concerns all of the land. And, but that's the way I chose to do my particular world. Um, if you, if you decided to do just one sovereign nation, that map would evolve differently than, say, my map did. If you didn't want to have a, a kingdom in which other sovereign nations adhered to, and they were just their own separate little things, then your map would evolve differently as well. It all depends on the kind of world that you're trying to make. Yeah. Um, I can try, simply because... <laughs> I, in my own personal experience, when I was writing my series, it started with one character. I didn't have the world planned out completely. Um, Basically, I had this character kicking around in my head, and I basically fleshed her out first. And then after that came, okay, she needs a sidekick, she needs a best friend, she needs a mentor. So I went characters first and then grew the world around them. And then I started establishing the various different races and where they settled. and. It depends on the kind of world builder you are and the kind of writer you are. I mean, I don't know if you've heard the, the phrases, are you a plotter, a pantser, or a plantser? Basically, are you, if you're a plotter, then you plot everything out in meticulous detail before you begin the process. If you're a pantser, you basically fly by the seat of your pants and <laughs> tackle things as they come along. And a plantser is kind of a mix of both. And I find that I'm, I find that I'm a plant, sir, because while I do have well over 50 pages of notes of lore and characters and just all the stuff from my world, I notice that as I write things out, and I do have key plot points mapped out, like, okay, this is going to happen in this one, and this is going to happen here, 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 here. I find that sometimes the events don't occur when I want them to. <laughs> it's 
It's like I'll be writing a scene and then all of a sudden I'll be like, oh my gosh, this will work better here than it will further down the line. Okay, goodbye plan. It's going here and I'll just deal with that issue later. And <laughs> so I guess there really is no right way to do it. I mean, if you prefer to build the world first, that's fine. Focus on all the areas and decide, okay, I want my world to be this. This is how it got to be to this point. These are the people that live in it. And now that I've got that done, let's work on the characters. If that works for you, that's fine. There is no right or wrong way to do it. It's your world, it's your process. You do you. <laughs> Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. <laughs> Uh, anyone else? Don't be shy. I'm the only one allowed to be shy here. <laughs> yeah. When you were making your world, was it hard to come up with some of the races so that they would tie in with the land itself? Actually, no, because uh, I already knew that I wanted elves, humans, and half-elves to feature very heavily. Um, when I was working on my villain, because the very first draft of my first book is completely different from the one that I published a few years ago. Um, the name stayed the same, but the characters themselves changed. And as the story changed, I realized that my villain simply wasn't going to work the way I had originally written her, and I needed a main protagonist. I needed somebody that all the other races of the surface would need to unify against. And when I decided to have the dwarves enslaved, I knew that the answer was really simple and that the dark elves would be my main antagonists because they're not very nice people. <laughs> I mean, if you read R.A. Salvatore, you know how mean they can be. <laughs> With a few exceptions. Drist. <laughs> Love him. <laughs> um, and this actually goes, oh my God, I finally remembered the point I was trying to remember yesterday. Go fig. Um, this actually goes hand in hand with being a self-published author. Because you don't want to be accused of stealing or plagiarizing, you are forced to really dig deep into your own imagination and create your own world and your own sandbox. You need to be able to make things just a little bit different. And so you find yourself... It's like if you read... Um, Ari Salvatore's Legend of the Drow, you know what their pantheon is and the head of their pantheon and all that. If you want to use dark elves, you need to use a different one because you're not playing in, you're not part of Wizards of the Coast. You need to make things just a little bit different to make it your own. So, um, I'm sorry, I think I got off topic. Did I answer your question at all? Okay, yay. <laughs> You can, you can totally do that. If you've, got, if you've got the imagination that would allow for it, by all means, if you wanna create some sort of strange hybrid creature that would be completely awesome in your world, go for it. Um, some sort of anthropomorphic, I don't know, squirrel people or something. Um, Whatever you have in mind, by all means, go ahead and do it. People are always on the lookout for something new. So I'd say take your idea and run with it. Yeah. How do you recognize when you are stepping beyond the accepted fantasy trope race, you get what I'm saying, and step, or stepping on the toes of plagiarism? Like how do you, where's that, how do you recognize that line? You read a lot. 
you read a lot of different <laughs> books by a lot of different authors and you're just like, I really like what they did here. How can I make it mine without... Like in, I use the dark elves and they're called dark elves. I don't use the word drow because I didn't know if that was specific to D&D &D and all that. And, you know, when you're an indie author, you have no money. Please don't sue me. It, that's basically your mentality. Just like, it's just different enough. Just please, <laughs> I have no money. <laughs> um, basically, you can use the races because elves have been around. Millennia. Yeah. <laughs> And Tol Tolkien uses them, D&D &D uses them. They're basically, a, every video game, fantasy-based uses them. So you're safe to use them and just tweak things a little bit. Like don't, if you wanna use halflings, don't call them hobbits, just call them halflings because that's the generalized term. And like I said, uh, establish a different pantheon for them. Like I did with the dark elves in my stories and with the elves and um, the humans, I really didn't, I just made them monotheistic. I was like, eh, you, you do you. I'm focusing on these ones. It's much more interesting. But yeah, my advice is just read, read and read and read. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, well, geography, of course, would be important um, in regards to different plots. Maybe you can have, like, say there's, of course, there's going to be different villages and whatnot, I'm assuming, or towns or cities. I don't know how you're building it, but maybe each civilization or population has their own specific cultural practices and or their own specific religious beliefs, regardless of whether or not they live in the same country or kingdom or duchy or... Uh, you can make... You can make them have different holidays or practices, like, say, the third Thursday of every fifth month, they... they set an effigy on fire or they leave something to the White Walkers or something to that degree. But you can make them as normal or as strange as you want them to. Um, basically, whatever you think would work best for the campaign that you're trying to build. I mean, whatever the end game might be, what quest from each region would help get to that point. And you can be as elaborate and as detailed as you want. There's no, there's no limit. I mean, if you're the DM, it's your house. <laughs> and if they don't want to play in your house, they can take their ball or take their dice and go home. <laughs> you know, there's, no, there's no limit to what you can do. You're only limited by your own imagination. So fly free. Anybody else? Uh, we still got some time. <laughs> yeah. What was the hardest uh, part of your creation? Uh, that would thinking up the dwarven holidays simply because. Um, they had been enslaved for so long in, in my book by the Dark Elves. Um, 
they basically forgot everything because if they were caught even talking about their religious beliefs or their cultural practices, they were basically put to death or punished with great prejudice because the dark elves wanted to remind them, you no longer matter. You are, you're less than dirt. So I knew that I had to establish something for them because when the redemption, when the redemption finally comes, they had to have something to try to recapture and something to try to rebuild again. So with them, I basically realized that I would have to start completely from scratch. I mean, I still kept their deities as part of my lore because that was like the one thing that couldn't be beaten out of them because it was just so deeply ingrained into them. But the holidays are still giving me trouble because they, they, have, nothing to, they have nothing to celebrate at this present moment. They're still waiting the chance to break free of their shackles and the horrible existence that they've been put into. But I have no doubt that once they are free, because I'm currently writing book four as we speak, it's not out yet. Once they're free, they'll be able to, they'll be able to have fun with creating their holidays because it'll literally be them just finding reasons to celebrate. Like, oh, this is the day we were freed. Let's throw a party. Oh, this is the day that our savior was born. Let's throw a party for that. Let's. And I think the hardest thing of all, though, was trying to find names for every single holiday for all the races. Because you didn't want them all to sound the same. So with the human races, I used a lot of Latin. You know, a little nod to back when I was in high school and I took Latin for four years. I'm finally getting use out of it. <laughs> um, with the Dark Elves, I believe I used... I believe I used Welsh for naming their holidays. And for the, for the Wood Elves, I believe I used... Irish or Gaelic? I... I think it was Gaelic that I used. I honestly can't remember. I'm going to have to look it up. But that was actually, as hard as it was, it was also a lot of fun because you got to look at these different languages and be like, okay, what, what sounds good for what this particular holiday is? And it's like, oh, that does sound nice. It really flows off the tongue. Or it'll just trip everyone up and they'll mispronounce it forever. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, the holidays are what really took the longest for me to do because I had to think of different names for them and all the different practices that went with them. And they're very, very different from humans to elves to the dark elves. I mean, one of the dark elven holidays involves warlocks coming up to the surface and just decimating fields of crops because it's in celebration of, uh, I'm blanking on the goddess's name, but basically she's the goddess of plague and pestilence. And so to celebrate her, they just destroy. lay waste and destroy. So it's just like once a year, they come up and they just, but on the flip side of that, the human version of, I guess, Christmas or Yule or whatever it is that you celebrate, they always have their door open, the humans do. So any traveler, weary passerby will always have a place at their table to get in from the cold, have a hot meal before they're able to go, before they're able to go on their way. So it's just you now little feelings of goodwill to offset the ugliness that they also have to deal with. So. While that was difficult, it was also a lot of fun because it was just, let's see, what would they do on Halloween? What would they do on Thanksgiving? And 
Christmas and spring. Yeah? Very difficultly. <laughs> um, basically, once I decided on a face claim, like how I imagine them in my head, I would just kind of stare at them for however long it took, just going through various names in my head and switching letters to see which, first of all, actually sounded like a name, and if the name actually fit them. Um, for example, with Gareth, the king of Garnetia, uh, I originally wanted to name him Jareth, but I was like, mm, no. So I switched the J to a G, and I was like, okay. It, I didn't realize that was an actual name until Dragon Age Inquisition came out and Solus's voice actor, whose name is Gareth, and I was like, oh, wasn't as, as imaginative as I thought. <laughs> and um, I actually do have kind of a funny, somewhat tragic story about character naming. Um, the king of Sephiris, his name is Alistair, and when I named him thusly, I originally intended him to be a helpful ally to Marin, my protagonist, and if you've played Dragon Age, you know who Alistair is. I imagined him just being a good guy, a decent guy, and as I was writing him, I realized that wasn't going to work. And the more I wrote him, the more of an asshole he became. <laughs> and I couldn't go back and change the name because it had already been established in book one. So I was just like, no! <laughs> Alistair isn't an ass. He's supposed to be nice. No! <laughs> and so, yeah, anytime I had to write him being just a total douchebag. I was just like, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> so if you're naming a character for a favorite character from a game or a movie, do so with caution. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Because if they end up not being the way you imagine them to be, you're going to be stuck with them <laughs> if it's already been canonically established. So bear that in mind. <laughs> Other than that, coming up with names can be a lot of fun because you do get to play around with letters and spelling, like add a Y where an I usually is to give it that little fantasy twist. Anyone else? Anyone? Place names. You touched on character names. Did place names? trouble? Actually, no. At, at least not for me. Um, it all tied in with the particular element of the dragon that dwelled in that particular land. Like, for example, Garnetia is where the fire dragon likes to hang his hat. So I thought, well, what's red? A garnet. A garnet's red. So I... Garnetia. Same with Sephiris, they're right by the ocean, and the water dragon and sapphires are blue, so I use that. I almost used a play on the word emerald for Terranus, but then I was like, mm, that might be a little too... Yes, <laughs> thank you. So I... I reverted back to Latin and Terra, Earth, so I just did a play on Terra for that. And um, with the Dark Elven Kingdom, I again reverted to Latin and called it Umbra for 
shadow and dark and um, basically I would just in naming the lands I would focus on what they were most known for and I would just I would go through in my head all right what's the Latin word for this what's the da -da 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 and that's how the names came about so if you're if you're having trouble naming a a landmass or a world or a kingdom try to focus on what makes that kingdom that kingdom if they're known for like if they're known for uh water name the name it something to do with water in some way shape or form or if they're known for fishing you know it's it's a good place to just really think and let your imagination go wild and yeah <laughs> don't go with something obvious like a trout mouth large mouth bass thank you very much <laughs> Or mackerel. Anyone else? Any questions? Comments? Concerns? No? All right, well, that's it. I got nothing else. <laughs> that's all she wrote. <laughs>